Uncommon Traveler, Mary Kingsley in Africa, written and illustrated by Don Brown. Mary Kingsley spent her childhood in a small house on a lonely lane outside London, England. Her mother was bedridden, her father rarely home, and Mary served as housekeeper, handyman, nursemaid, and servant. Not until she was thirty years old did Mary get her chance to explore the world she'd read about in her father's library. In 1893, she arrived in West Africa, where she encountered giant flying insects, crocodiles, hippos, and brutal heat. Mary endured the hardships of the equatorial country and thrived. In Uncommon Traveler, Don Brown introduces us to an inspiring heroine who, against all odds, came to embody the very spirit of exploration and discovery. In 1870, a small house stood on a lonely lane outside London, England. Bricks filled nearly all of the front windows. Shutters blocked the back windows. Vines choked the back wall. Gloom ruled the rooms. Eight-year-old Mary Kingsley lived there. It was as if she lived alone. Her father, George, traveled the world seeking adventure. Her mother, also named Mary, was sickly and rarely left her bed. Her younger brother, Charles, was away at school. Mary didn't go to school and would never go to school. The whole of my childhood and youth was spent at home in the house and garden, she later said. The living outside world I saw little of. I felt out of place at the few parties I ever had the chance of going to, for I knew nothing of play and such things. Still, Mary was happy. I had a great, amusing world of my own, the books in Father's library. Novels and poetry books, science and history books, travel and adventure books. Books were her companions and teachers. But there was a life beyond the library, and Mary was a dutiful daughter. She nursed her mother. She tidied the house. She helped her father during his few visits. George Kingsley wrote about his travels, and Mary happily uncovered facts he needed from her beloved library. She knew to be quiet and make little fuss, or risk George's temper and have a book thrown at her. She was the family's handyman, too. Mary taught herself home repair by reading English Mechanic magazine. Once a leaky pipe needed mending, standing on a box beneath it, I cut the lead pipe gallantly through, Mary recalled. But Mary forgot to turn off the water. Swish came out a jet of water, that knocked me over, box and all. She had other repairs, other odd jobs, other chores to do. Mary's narrow life as handyman, nursemaid, servant, and aid went on for days, for weeks. For years, childhood ended, youth disappeared. In 1892, her mother and father died. For the first time in her life, 
Good daughter Mary Kingsley was free of her duties. She was 30 years old. Her world, once cramped and dark, was now as big as the globe. The idea of it made her head spin. Inspired by her father's journeys and the travel books she loved, Mary had the remarkable notion of going to West Africa. People thought Mary was foolish. Much of West Africa was a mystery, even to those who lived there. Visitors risked disease, wild animal attacks, and the hostility of some Africans. West Africa was not a place for a single woman to visit. Mary ignored the warnings and planned her trip. She would travel light, without a tent, eating native food and wearing her regular English clothes. She would trudge, wade, clamber, and climb in a high-necked, long-sleeved shirt, long, heavy skirt, and proper Victorian boots. She arrived in West Africa in 1893. Mary was delighted! Oh, the grand and vivid sights, sounds, and smells she met. She ignored the scorching heat and the soggy air and the odd insects. One looked like a flying lobster. Another, an enormous beetle, flopped into a soup plate and then shook itself dry like a retriever. She collected insects and freshwater fish, which she later donated to the British Museum of Natural History. Of course, Mary encountered creatures bigger than fish and insects. When Mary explored a riverbank, a hippo blocked her way. I scratched him behind the ear with my umbrella, and we parted on good terms, she said. In a swamp, an eight-foot-long crocodile chose to get his front paws over the stern of my canoe, said Mary. I had to retire to the bow to keep the balance and fetch him a clip on the snout with a paddle. This was only a pushing young creature who had not learnt manners. Unfazed by the wild beasts, rough country, and terrific heat, Mary pushed farther inland and met the people who dwelled there. Once a trek up a steep hill provided a surprise meeting with some of them. I slipped, slid, and finally fell plump through the roof of an unprotected hut, Mary recalled. A great hubbub followed, and she paid for the damage she had done. Mary met members of the Ajumba, Igalua, and Mapongwe tribes, but she felt a special closeness to the Fong people. She admired them greatly. The Fong is full of fire, temper, intelligence, and go, she said. Filled with fire, temper, intelligence, and go herself, Mary was drawn deeper into West Africa. A paddle wheeler carried Mary more than 100 miles up the Ogulwe River. There she gathered guides and boarded a canoe. The river was treacherous. She and her guides often crashed into boulders or spun wildly in whirlpools and had to leap for their lives. Mary then plunged into the uncharted forest toward the Rambue River. It was a wild trek. The forest canopy hid the sky. Thick vines roped the trees. Great blossoms dotted the forest floor in glorious cups of orange and crimson and pure white.
Mary and her guides struggled over a hill covered with broken trees felled by a great storm. The hot, wet air blanketed them like a great weight. Elephants, gorillas, and velvety-skinned snakes crossed their path. They stopped for the night at a Fong village. Mosquitoes and lice kept Mary awake. Restless, she borrowed a canoe and slid it into the nearby lake. All was purple-black. Only the stars and glowworms twinkled. Silver-white fish sprang from the water, reminding Mary of flashing swords. She paddled to a far bank, stepped onto the shore, and discovered she wasn't alone. I felt the earth quiver under my feet and heard a soft, big soughing sound, and looking round, saw I had dropped in on a hippo banquet, Mary said. I made out five of the immense brutes round me, so I softly returned to the canoe and shoved off. She bathed in the lake, returned to camp just before dawn, and continued on. Once, she stumbled into a spike-filled pit used to trap animals and narrowly escaped harm. It is at these times that you realize the blessings of a good, thick skirt, she observed. A slippery log bridged a ravine. Mary walked it like a tightrope. Mary and her group plodded through sun-cooked swamps of ink-black slime. The stench was awful. Flies pestered them. Sometimes they sank up to their necks in the filthy water. They finally emerged from the swamps and reached the mud banks of the Rambue River, to the great surprise of nearby villagers. A noisy crowd soon surrounded them. Mary's journey up the Ogue River and across the forest to the Rembue River was a great feat, but she didn't crow. She called it a mere picnic. Picnic or not, West Africa tugged at Mary. If I have a heaven, she said, that will be mine. Mary returned to England, where she wrote about Africa and talked about Africa. Thousands of people read her books and listened to her lectures. They were astonished that a woman had experienced such adventures. She found fame, for which she didn't care a hairpin. She still had few friends and felt out of place at parties. Mary filled her apartment with African masks and charms, Baskets and sculptures. She kept the rooms hot and humid. To remind her of Africa. To remind her of home.